The Hellenistic period in Greek art represents a drastic change in style and a real departure from the style of the classical period. Alexander the Great takes over Greece in 334. He defeats the Persian Empire, and here I'm showing you a mosaic in which we see Alexander the Great with his great flowing locks is locked in battle with Darius, King Darius of Persia, who is fleeing the Greek army. Here is Alexander the Great, who is always depicted as youthful and idealized, but with these great flowing and sometimes described as leonine locks. Alexander the Great's conquest of the Near East and Egypt really ushers in a new cultural age. The word Hellenistic means Greek-like, and it really references the spread of the Hellenistic peoples and culture all over the empire that Alexander the Great conquered. In 323 BCE, Alexander the Great is assassinated and leaves a vast empire with no real successor and no administrative plan for continuation. Local kingdoms take over as the leading cultural forces and Athens isn't as powerful. The empire begins to crumble. Greek city-states try to form a new mutual protection league, but it never really achieves the significance and power as it had before. Democracy survives, mostly in form, but really not in practice. By the third century BCE, three major powers dominate. Macedonia, Egypt, and the Asian Minor, Mesopotamia, and Persia. And by the second to first century BCE, the empire will fall to the Roman Empire. But Alexander the Great made a lasting, had a lasting legacy, less because of the empire, but more because of the spread of Greek culture. He established the capital of Alexandria in Egypt, which had a famous library that held 700,000 scrolls. The Hellenistic period then lasts until the first century BCE with the Augustan era of the Roman Empire. And if we can characterize the classical period as stoic and calm, emphasizing general heroic qualities and idealism, the Hellenistic period is characterized by the dramatic moment, wanting to emphasize empathy and emotion, emphasizing also the individual and the specific. The late classical period really laid the groundwork for some of the themes that we will see carry over into the Hellenistic period, but it goes so much further. Whereas we have idealism in the classical period, we have drama in the Hellenistic period. And here are some of the, uh, the contrasts that we can make between these two periods that I've kind of laid out in a chart. During the classical period, we see figures that are very much confined to their own space, not really interacting with other figures. They had a smooth sculpted surface that allowed for a clear, even light. The figures promoted composure and stability, and even with the contrapposto pose, we saw a real sense of balance. They also inspired the viewer to be intellectually committed to the subject, meaning that we had distance and we were able to appreciate and admire the balance and control that the subject had over nature. During the Hellenistic period, however, we see figures that are very much in interaction, not just with other figures, but even with the viewer. 
we see dramatic contrasts of light and shade play over complex surfaces and forms in high relief. And if you take as the example the Laocon, which you'll be hearing about in some detail, we see all of these pockets that capture dark, rich light uh, shadow, as opposed to the light bouncing off of the uh, the um, uh, the three dimensional surfaces. We see expressions of extreme pain or stress, anger or despair. All of these vivid emotions are um, affecting the viewer. We see figures also forcefully imposing themselves on the viewer and the viewer's space. They tend to come out of their own space and into ours. They are beckoning us into the drama of their subjects. Viewers then are meant to empathize with the subject. We see their emotional, um, emotional state and we are, uh, they are inviting us into the narrative, inviting us into their story. During the Hellenistic period, there are two broad and conflicting trends. And the first is the one that we'll really talk about because it is such a departure from what we've seen before. The Pergamone style or the anti-classical, which really um, stems from Pergamon over here in Turkey. And then we also have a trend that leads back to the classical models and reflects a return to the classicism of uh, Pericles' Athens. Sculptures that epitomize the Pergamone trend of the Hellenistic style are sculptures that adorn a large monument on the sanctum of Athena in Pergamon. They illustrate the victory of Attalus I over the Gauls. Attalus was a ruler that reigned from 241 to 197 BCE. This sculpture, the Gaelic chieftain killing himself and his wife, was a Roman copy after a bronze statue, and it would have been placed on a pedestal. This sculpture really marks a huge departure from the subject matter that we would see even in the late classical period. The chieftain is in the act of committing suicide after his defeat. He's also murdered his wife so that she would not be under the, um, the, under the forces of Attalus as well. We see the heaviness of her body as he holds her up after he's just murdered her. And now he is about to plunge his knife into his chest. And we even see the beginning of that wound and the blood that is starting to drip. This is a real shift from the depiction of an enemy that we've seen in the past in Greek art. Usually the Greeks would depict the other or their enemies as barbaric and wild. But here we see the dignity of the other, the dignity of the enemy. He's depicted in the nude, like a heroic warrior or athlete. And we see him about to uh, commit suicide rather than admit defeat. The Gaelic chieftain here is depicted in the nude like a Greek warrior or a heroic athlete or a Greek god. And he is in the process of plunging a knife into his chest rather than admit defeat or rather than accept defeat. And this is something that would have been admirable to the Greeks. There are some things that were worse than death, such as the loss of honor. And they're showing him doing something that they would consider honorable. And he's plunging that knife into his chest without fear and with dignity. And his figure with his upraised arm and 
all of these uh, and this twisted pose is in contrast to the weighty death of the figure of his wife. You'll also notice that the pose of the figure and this figural combination almost escapes from the space of the pedestal. He is twisting in three dimensions. He is uh, moving out into our space. The figure of the wife is actually almost collapsing off of the pedestal. It's also inviting the viewer to walk around the sculpture to understand the narrative from all different sides. We are not looking at this sculpture from far away, like in the Parthenon, when we would be looking up at the pediment sculptures from a distance and having that detached distance from the gods above. Here, we are right there with them in understanding the dramatic occurrences and the dramatic actions of the protagonist. Art here is interactive. It is evoking a response from the viewer. It wants our emotional reaction. Another sculpture from this monument is one called the Dying Gaul or the Gaul Trumpeteer. Um, and we see his trumpet right here. Um, he is part of that army that has just been defeated by Adelos the First. We see him fatally wounded and struggling to fight death. He's very close to death and he is um, at the point of really acceptance. The artist here is seeking to find the viewer's admiration and pity for the subject rather than presenting the enemy as an other or a bar barbaric other as the Greek artists have done in the past. He's trying to evoke an emotional response from us at the same time marking the subject as Gaelic. We see, um, first of all, a mustache, which uh, marks him as, uh, as one of the Gaelic armies, part of the Gaelic army, and he's wearing this neck, um, uh, this neck rope that also is Celtic battle dress. So we know very clearly that he is fighting, he's on the other side, um, but, the artist is empathizing with the enemy. You'll also notice that the weight of the figure as he's struggling to stay up is also pushing him into our space. As soon as he falls down and gives into the weight of death, he's going to fall off of the pedestal and into our space. These deep pockets of dark, of, of shadow, um, that you know, maybe around the crevice of his thigh or up into the um, this very thick hair, we see how light is now falling across the surface in a way that gives a lot of um, anim uh, animation to the subject. But overall, this drama, the idea that we are being pulled into the narrative is what really characterizes the Hellenistic style.